Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is whether or not animals have building blocks in terms of how they put together their calls. We know that animals produce calls that have referential meaning. We know that there's, for example, if you take a look at some of the monkeys, they'll produce a call that says there's a predator in the sky or there's one on the ground. But the question is, how do we decide whether or not there's something more than that? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And the, the reason that this is important, one, if we want to go any further in animal communication than where we have, we've got to start understanding these things. And of course, if you're interested in human evolution, you know, looking at models of how other animals may have acquired some type of language like uh, structures is very interesting as well. So the question that I'm, I kind of want to start with is, is it the case that we have acoustic units or phonemes for different types of things, and if I can get the cursor over there. Um, and there's at least one animal for which this is true. If we take a look at human speech. Pilot's heads looked ridiculously small. So what we were listening to, this is the visual representation of it, a spectrogram. This is about three seconds going across this way. And this is the frequency going from zero to 8,000 hertz. And any place you see this bright yellow stuff, that means there's acoustic energy there. Now, what I'd like to point out is that this right here is the word pilot. And if you don't speak human, right, if you don't speak a human language, you might not be tempted to break this down into the sounds p, i, l, uh, t, right, the, the phonemes as we call them. But if I change one of those just a little bit, if I change the l sound to a r, all of a sudden it's the pirate's heads were ridiculously small, and the meaning changes quite a bit. So being able to detect these types of acoustic units, if they exist in other animals, is something that could be really interesting to do. Now, I'm not going to claim that every animal has these. Down on the bottom, I have another spectrogram. This is from a plain fin midshipman. So I'm going to play that real quick. So it might make your three-year-old laugh, but trying to find something that you, know, you can really say, oh, this, this has meaning in here, might be a little tough. Not to say it's not there, but we don't see it. So if we're interested in trying to be able to do this, the question is, how do we go about doing it, right? I mean, we can't ask the animals. So there's basically two ways that I see that you can start taking a look at this. One is from the production side. You start taking a look at the animals and you say, how do they produce sounds, right? What, do they have an oral cavity? How are they manipulating it? And there's constraints in terms of what they can produce, the types of sounds, and maybe the order they can produce them in. And the other way to look at it is from the reception side, looking at what arrives at the ear and how we take that acoustic energy and convert it into neural energy, and then looking inside the brain and saying, what do we do with that neural energy? How is the animal processing it? Now, it might be that all of this is very important. We really need to look at all of these facets in order to solve this problem. But we have to start somewhere. And for my money, I think that starting on the reception side is what makes sense. Because if an animal is sending a communication signal, and we know that they do send communication signals, then being able to determine what the receiver is picking up and understanding may be the way to go. So the way that I chose to address this was to look at the reception side and I built on the work of um, a group led by Lakatos. So I'm not going to walk you through all the details of this slide because I only have 10 minutes. I would love to. You can ask me if you're really, really curious. Um, but basically, this was work on ma macaque monkeys. And what they did was they hooked up electroencephalograms to the poor monkey's little brain. And then they took a look at how the neurons were firing. And the take home message here is there are some neurons that are firing fairly slowly. Okay. And then you have other ones that are firing much, much faster. And it turns out to be that the argument that Lakatos was making is that the slow firing ones was basic, were basically priming the fast ones. So there's a rhythm and a way to take a look at this. Now, when I took a look at this, I was like, oh, well, maybe we can somehow mimic this, right? And so that's kind of what I was interested in doing. So there's been some more work done on it. Lakatos published a paper in Science in 2008 where they were basically showing that that slow firing could be modulated. Basically, it was an attention mechanism, and the monkey's trying to do something else. That changes. Okay. The other thing that's been done, there's been a couple groups who have worked on humans and basically looked at this as well. And one, we know the same types of mechanisms are happening, so that's good. We know it's across the primates, or at least two of the primates. And what they found with the humans what that was interesting 
is they set up something called octave space filters. Now all this means, it's a little bit of signal processing, it means we take the low frequencies and we pull all the stuff out of there, we double it, <coughs> you know, a little bit higher and a little bit wider, and we double it again and basically break it up that way. When you take a look at the energy that's in these octave space filter bands, it correlates very, very nicely with the neural firings. So this gives us a path forward to possibly look at this. Now the other thing that they found that was interesting was it appears that, you know, remember we talked about the attention mechanism being able to change that slow metronome. Well, looking at things inside the human speech, it appears that the humans were paying attention to that. They started degrading the speech and this started going away a little bit. So that's a downside because we don't know what the animals are paying attention to. We don't know what landmarks are important. So we're not going to be able to do everything, but we have enough here to basically start thinking about, can I build a system in software that's inspired by the biology that's going to let get come up with some reasonable segmentation of an animal sound, and then we can start figuring out whether or not these acoustic units are really meaningful. So <coughs> the big things that I talked about are that, you know, this idea of locking the metronome onto the content. We, we, we don't know how to do that because we don't know what's important. We don't know what oscillation rates other species might have as well, but we can vary that and try it. Now, the thing that's nice about this is that if you take a look at human speech, you know, we, we study ourselves all the time. So there's lots of corporate out there where I can go ahead and test this and see how well we do on human speech. And that's exactly what we did. So I'm going to give you a very, very brief overview of how this system works. To kind of introduce you to this slide, this is the spectrogram, the same one we sound saw down at the bottom. It's only there for your edification. The algorithm doesn't care about it. There's some green vertical lines that you see going through here. These are phoneme boundaries. And then what we have all through here are the octave filters. And you can see the energy in them. And you can see that, for example, where the energy goes up, that's right around one of these green lines. So this is kind of what the theory would predict. Okay? These red markers that you're seeing are where we have using an algorithm that was designed to basically catch those rapid ramp ups. And we don't always get all of them, but we get a lot of them. Just to sh for the sake of completeness, here's the last three octave filters. There are some, here's an example where somebody's saying sss, right, the S sound. There's a lot of high frequency energy in that. Well, this is only the really high frequency octave that picks that one up, right? So now we have to somehow put all these things together and we don't have any clues from the neurology in terms of neuroscience in terms of how that's happening, but we just dump them in a bucket. Right? And then what we do is we simulate this phase locking by saying, when we get one of these, we assume that's where we're going to phase lock, and we suppress anything that comes very quickly after that. All right? Now, we've tried this on some human speech. We've used from 630 speakers, we've taken 10 sentences from each of them, and we've scored it. And basically what we found was that we were able to retrieve 42% of those phoneme boundaries. So that means there's something there. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But we know there's a lot of things that humans are doing that we're not, right? In terms of the accuracy, the things that we detected, almost 90% of them were correct. So this, this gives me hope. Now, this right here is showing the, the actual output. I'm going to skip over it in the, the sake of time. Here we're going to take a look at an output from a chimpanzee. So this is a chimpanzee pant hoot. I will play it for you in a minute. Notice we don't have green lines anymore because we don't know what's right. These white lines are where the system is predicting that we have something. Any place you see these pink triangles, those are things we suppressed because they were too close. Now, if you can see from back there, you might notice that the, this, between here and here, the spectral content is very different. It changes quite a bit. So we seem to be pretty good at picking this type of stuff up. This is, this is data from my collaborator, Kat Hobader, at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. And one of the things when we've sat down and we've listened to these, almost always we can hear the change where the system predicts it. Not always, sometimes we get it wrong, but it seems to do a pretty good job. Now I'm going to play this far for you, and I apologize for the very weak green lines that unless you're in the front row you probably can't see. Uh, this is software from Cornell called Raven that we're using to display this, and unfortunately Raven does not have anything that lets you draw these lines very, very uh, thicker than what we've got. But I will play it real quick so you can at least hear a chimpanzee pant hoot. So through here, change, 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 change. I can't do it fast enough. But there's th this is where you see a lot of changes. There's changes in other places. But really, 
through here, if, if you look at the spectrogram, you can see it's kind of going like that, and we're picking that type of stuff up. So we hope, we, at this point, it's anecdotal. We don't know that it's actually going to work, but we think it will. Um, just to give you an idea of what we're tr trying to do from here, we, we've shown that it works in certain cases. We're trying to cluster the stuff right now, and we think that if this pans out, we've got really something to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Marie, uh, I was curious uh, why you chose uh, these specific harmonics th between 32 and 512. Is that a reason? Uh, yeah, so, so Bill, we were basically looking for, it, so it's not, it's not just 32 hertz, that's the center frequency of that band. So we're basically looking for octave filters, and we just started off with, I think it was um, 0 to 64, and then we just keep on doubling up through there. We could have chosen it to be a little bit wider. Marie, one of the real interesting tests of whether you could figure this out would be based on the predictions to generate those sounds from the computational stimulation and see if they have an impact on the way an animal might respond. Absolutely. So what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to cluster the segmentations and see if we can identify specific units. And if we can, the, the goal is to basically start playback experiments where we change things out. Uh, this is an unfunded project, so I'm doing this in my spare time, and we'll see how fast we go yeah. on this. Other questions? All right, I'm going to ask another question. What, you've done a lot of work on marine mammals. Correct. Right? And so the, marine mammals have this different situation of where mm -hmm. the transmission of sound in water is different than it is through air. Does, does that change the dynamics of how you look at these sounds and the dynamics of both production and response? Well, even, even if you're t looking at terrestrial animals, the production mechanisms can be very, very different, right? If you take a look at, uh, say, what a, how a cricket's producing sound, you know, a lot of inde index insects use striation, right? Um, whereas when you look at most mammals, they have vocal folds. So yes, that type of stuff's going to change. In terms of dolphins, one of the things that I think is, is different and why I chose not to use dolphins for this particular topic is that when you look at whistles that are used for communication, they tend to be a bit smoother, and I didn't really know that this was going to work, and also we didn't know that there's no evidence that they're using the same type of thing. So I, I know this is happening in primates. Might be happening in other mammals, but we're not sure. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.